Today, as every day, our nation's farmers are hard at work. Their job is big. Their labors give us the raw materials to feed and clothe our people. And it takes a lot of work to feed and clothe all our people. It takes a lot of plant food to nourish our nation's crops. And the American farmer has learned to use commercial fertilizer to take care of these plant food needs. For these plant foods, our farmers have turned to the fertilizer industry, which each year manufactures millions of tons of fertilizer, representing an investment of over a billion dollars. The fertilizer industry processes raw materials into finished fertilizers for farm use. Locked in these compounds, as they pour from the factory, are the primary plant foods needed by all growing plants. Nitrogen, available phosphate, and potash, plus such other nutrients as may be required. These are the chemical symbols used to designate these plant foods, N, P2O5, and K2O. The percentage of each primary plant food is clearly shown on the bag. The first figure represents fertilizer nitrogen, which comes to us in many forms and combinations. Throughout the nation, manufacturing plants have been built to produce nitrogen compounds for use by agriculture. From the skies above us, even from the air we breathe, these great manufacturing plants extract nitrogen, and through the miracles of chemistry, change it into usable forms for growing crops. These huge, complex chemical manufacturing units costing tens of millions of dollars require skillful operation and consume enormous amounts of power. In these plants, nitrogen taken from the atmosphere is combined with other chemicals commonly called carriers. As a first step, and hydrous ammonia is formed by chemically uniting nitrogen and hydrogen under pressure. Ammonia, normally a gas, is compressed and stored in high pressure tanks called Horton spheres. Ammonia is a starting point for the manufacture of many solid and liquid nitrogen fertilizers. Ammonia itself is also used as a fertilizer. This ammonia is used to make nitric acid which, when treated with more ammonia, yields ammonium nitrate. When nitric acid is reacted with sodium compounds, sodium nitrate is produced. Nitrate of soda also comes from natural deposits in Chile. Nitric acid reacted with calcium carbonate yields calcium nitrate fertilizer. Ammonia combined with sulfuric acid produces ammonium sulfate. Ammonia may be combined with phosphoric acid to produce ammonium phosphate. Ammonia reacted with carbon dioxide produces urea. Liquid forms of nitrogen fertilizer are sometimes made by mixing these and other nitrogen bearing materials in water. Coke oven gas, a byproduct of the steel industry, is another source of ammonia. This ammonia is usually processed into ammonium sulfate. Nitrogen can also be captured from air with the use of electric arcs, as is done in this plant. The nitrogen fertilizer so produced is calcium cyanamide. Synthetic nitrogen materials and natural nitrate of soda are imported by this country in substantial quantities. Various animal and vegetable products, like the cottonseed shown here, may be processed into nitrogen fertilizer. Now, what about phosphate, the second figure on the fertilizer bag? The United States is very fortunate in possessing large quantities of phosphate rock, the source of this necessary plant food. A substantial portion of the world's phosphate comes from our extensive mining operations. Mines such as this require thousands of acres and large amounts of capital. Large deposits of phosphate rock are located in Florida and Tennessee, also in the western states of Idaho, Montana, Utah, and Wyoming. The natural phosphate mineral, which, as in Florida, is often found a few feet below the Earth's surface, is strip-mined by enormous drag lines. 
Millions of years ago, this phosphate deposit was laid down on the bed of an ancient sea. The phosphate ore is the remains of many billions of marine animals. Bones and teeth of prehistoric fish may still be found in some of these deposits. Powerful water jets are used to convert the deposit into a slurry. This slurry is then pumped through pipes to the refinery where it is scrubbed and screened to remove impurities. Also, in the West, large deposits of phosphate rock are mined and processed for fertilizers. The refined phosphate, regardless of origin, is analyzed and graded before being shipped to phosphate processing plants all over the country. In these processing plants, specially designed machinery converts the valuable phosphate into forms more readily usable for growing crops. Superphosphate, the most widely used phosphatic fertilizer, is made by treating ground phosphate rock with diluted sulfuric acid, as is being done here. The acid treating process, called acidulation, converts the relatively insoluble phosphate rock into a more useful plant food. Following acidulation, the superphosphate is further processed and cured to give a top quality product. Another acid called phosphoric is produced by treating this phosphate rock with an excess of the same sulfuric acid. Usually this phosphoric acid is used to treat more phosphate rock thus producing concentrated superphosphate. Or the phosphoric acid is reacted with ammonia to produce ammonium phosphate. Phosphoric acid is also produced from phosphate rock by means of an electric furnace and acid burner. A recent development in this country has been the production of a nitrogen phosphate fertilizer called nitrophosphate made by treating phosphate rock with nitric acid. All types of phosphate materials supply phosphate essential for plant nutrition. Among these are superphosphate, concentrated superphosphate, ammonium phosphate, nitrophosphate, phosphoric acid. Now, what about potash, represented by the third figure on the fertilizer bag? The development of the potash industry in the United States stands as an inspiring monument to the ingenuity and enterprise of our agricultural chemical industry. Large deposits are located in the West, principally in New Mexico and California, with minor deposits in Utah and Michigan. Potash minerals such as these, exhibiting all the wondrous beauty of nature, are mined and refined to a high state of purity for use as agricultural and industrial potash. From underground, the raw ore is mined and transported to modern refineries where the valuable potash is recovered. Ancient Searles Lake in the Mojave Desert in California is a storehouse of nature's chemicals. It yields a brine from which agricultural potash and other chemicals are obtained. In these vast western areas, the work goes on every day of the year to meet the constantly increasing demand for potash. Muriate of potash represents over 90% of the potash contained in fertilizer. Sulfate of potash and sulfate of potash magnesia are among other potash containing materials. These fertilizer raw materials containing nitrogen, phosphate, or potash must then be shipped to mixing plants where stockpiles are kept to ensure adequate supplies for the areas served. From these stockpiles, the materials are processed into mixed fertilizers designed to meet the specific needs of the individual crops. Now, let's see what actually goes into the making of a ton of 10-10-10 fertilizer. Typical ingredients are 804 pounds of nitrogen carrying materials such as nitrogen solutions, ammonium sulfate, and urea. 
These materials provide 10 units of nitrogen. This gauge measures the amount of nitrogen solution being weighed into the mixture. The necessary phosphate comes principally from superphosphates and concentrated superphosphates. These materials total another 862 pounds. The materials fall into a large hopper and the weight is registered on an accurate scale. The required potash is supplied by 334 pounds of muriate of potash. The total, 2,000 pounds. After weighing, the solid and liquid materials are carefully combined in the mixing drum, which serves as a chemical reactor. After the fertilizer is made, the elevators and conveyors carry it to storage bins where it is allowed to cure. This provides time for the chemical reactions between the components to be completed. The cured product is taken from these storage bins and ground prior to bagging. The result, a fertilizer having good physical condition. In some plants, fertilizer mixtures are put into a granular or pellet form. This job requires the use of additional processing equipment such as granulators, dryers, and coolers. Periodic chemical tests are made on each run to ensure a fertilizer of uniform plant food content. This is the finished product. This 100-pound bag of 10-10-10 fertilizer guaranteed to contain 10 pounds of nitrogen, 10 pounds of available phosphate, and 10 pounds of available potash, giving a total of 30 pounds of the three primary plant foods. The remaining 70 pounds in the bag consist principally of the elements with which these three primary plant nutrients are combined and which serve as carriers. Without carriers, these primary plant food elements would not be usable as fertilizers. Now, let's go to the laboratory and meet A.J. Engel, scientist in the fertilizer section of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He's going to demonstrate why we cannot use pure nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium as fertilizers. First, let's take the element nitrogen. At ordinary temperatures, it's a colorless gas, so you actually can't see it. In this bell jar, we have nitrogen displacing the colored liquid. Here, we have nitrogen cooled 320 degrees below zero. It's a liquid which evaporates as soon as it warms up. Nitrogen in either of these forms cannot be used by growing plants. To make it available, it must be combined with other elements. This model illustrates how the elements are chemically combined in a molecule of ammonium sulfate. The molecule contains two atoms of nitrogen, eight atoms of hydrogen, four atoms of oxygen, and one atom of sulfur. About 20% of the weight of ammonium sulfate is available nitrogen. The other elements make up the remaining 80%. Next, let us take a look at phosphorus, the building stone of phosphate. Here we have pure phosphorus. See how it bursts into flame as soon as exposed to the warm air. It too must be combined with other elements before it can be used as a plant food. Finally, here's potassium, the active ingredient of potash. It's a soft, silvery white metal. It reacts violently with water. Consequently, potassium alone can't be used as a fertilizer, but must be combined with other elements to give compounds which can be handled safely. I trust that this little demonstration has shown you why fertilizers, by necessity, are not 100% plant foods. As assured by the analysis on the bag, this 100 pounds of 10-10-10 fertilizer contains 30 pounds of the primary plant nutrients, nitrogen, phosphate, and potash. But such carriers as calcium and sulfur are also plant nutrients in their own right. So the bag really contains more plant nutrients than are guaranteed.
The contents of the bag represent the tremendous scientific know-how of the chemical fertilizer industry. But the story doesn't end here. The farmers see much more than chemical compounds when they look at a bag of fertilizer. They see an opportunity to produce crops of better quality at lower cost. They see green, healthy, more productive crops. They see a more prosperous and healthier America. An America that long has remained strong and great with the efforts of farmers who till their soil and care for its needs. They see food grown at lower cost, minerals that help Mother Nature make more profit for farmers and a higher standard of living for consumers everywhere. They see the strong fibers from enriched soils, soils that make America the best clothed nation in the world. These essential minerals, these plant foods, are a vital part of our strength. America needs good fertilizers to help build a strong agriculture for the future.